<laughs> like when I think of cool jobs, what do you want to be? Astronaut, movie star, elevator designer. All right, Danny, chill out. Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Business Blaze, the five hugely successful companies that you've never heard of. I'm your host, Simon. This script is written by Danny. We're gonna go through it and we're gonna learn something together. Let's crack on. Wealth and fame go together like very expensive peanut butter and equally expensive jelly. I don't think those things go together. I know every American's gonna disagree with me, but it's weird. And also we call jelly jam. We got the real jam going down. Also, Danny's British. What's up, Danny? <laughs> if you're a corporate company, <laughs> this is the second time Danny is referred to corporate company. I don't know what sort of companies there are that are not corporate. Like, if your corporate company is raking in tens of billions of dollars every year, there's a strong chance that Joe Public has heard of you, knows exactly what you do, and has a fierce opinion about how much corporate tax you're dodging. Amazon! <laughs> I mean, it's all well and good to complain about it, but then also I'll go onto Amazon and I'll be like, yeah, let's get something that's absolutely as cheap as possible. But not always. Some of the most successful companies in the world prefer to lurk mysteriously in the shadows. They've accrued the wealth, but they're not remotely interested in the fame. That's usually because they're the sort of companies that deal directly with other businesses instead of everyday consumers. So they're unlikely to hit you over the head on a regular basis with multi-million dollar marketing. Here are five, that's a treat, of the most intriguing filthy rich companies who prefer to shun the limelight and count their cash from behind the scenes. I'm also wondering, this first one, Yum Brands Inc. I have not heard of, but I'm wondering how many of these ones that I have actually heard of. Because I feel like I make a lot of videos, like on other channels that I do. So I feel like my knowledge, like my general knowledge, is generally quite high. Uh, if you were asked to name some of the biggest ever fast food restaurant companies in the world, you'd be more than likely to go with something like McDonald's, Burger King, or Domino's Pizza. Don't discount KFC, Danny. KFC is legit the best. Uh, you're probably a little less likely to go with Yum. And this would be a shame because Yum Brands Inc. is the world's largest fast food company in terms of restaurants and reach. Surely McDonald's or something like that is. Currently only over 43,000 restaurants in 135 nations worldwide. That's even more than McDonald's. Or maybe they're all in China or something? <laughs> the reason Yum may not flow so freely from the everyday tongue is because you don't see the name plastered on the front of the restaurants. You just don't, you don't take the kids out for a Yum Happy Meal or dine out with friends over a Yum Family Bucket. That's true. Instead, the company based in Louisville, Kentucky is the secret driving force behind other big brands. Ah, okay, so it's not based in China. It's just like the umbrella that has many brands underneath it, which I imagine we know the name of. As you may have guessed from the location, that includes KFC. <laughs> ah, Kentucky Fried Chicken. KFC, Pizza Hut, Taco Bell, and Wing Street. I went, we don't have Taco Bell in Europe, as far as I'm aware. I went to a Taco Bell in the States because a friend of mine who's an American was like, dude, how have you never been to Taco Bell? You gotta go, it's great. It's distinctly average to poor. <laughs> Grant, you were wrong. <laughs> Uh, Wing Street sounds great, though. If you've ever wondered why those restaurants serve Pepsi rather than Coke, it may have something to do with the fact that PepsiCo once owned these operations before creating the spin-off company Tricon Global Restaurants in 1997, which eventually evolved into the deliciously short and snappy Yum in 2002. Yeah, like Tricon Global Restaurants sounds like a villain company from a comic book. Yum, and it's got an exclamation point, by the way, sounds a lot more uh, hip. Currently worth around $35 billion, Yum may be the king of fast food by number of chain brands and global reach, but the company is still battling out with McDonald's over the title of the biggest restaurant company by revenue. There you go. I hadn't heard of... Oh, we're not done yet. <laughs> Royal McDonald currently has the upper hand here, helped along by Yum's recent misfortunes in China. A poultry scandal which revealed high levels of antibiotics and in the meat served in Chinese KFC restaurants led to Yum cutting ties with their previous suppliers and promising improved quality control. This is such a classic company move, like shitty business, shitty business, the public find out, let's improve, and then a slow decline back to where we were before. <laughs> there are several companies which I imagined coming to mind, which I'm not going to name, <laughs> that follow this model. <laughs> But with outbreaks of avian flu created, I remember avian, like bird flu. I swear this was a big thing like three years ago, four years ago. Everyone was like, oh, bird flu, oh my God. What was that about? Did anyone ever actually get bird flu? Or was it Ebola a few years ago? I think it was Ebola a few years ago. And then it was, Ebola sounds a lot more serious than bird flu. And bird flu a little bit before that. But with outbreaks of avian flu creating great concern in China at the time, it's taking a while for China to learn to trust KFC again. And the fallout from this has clipped the wings 
of Yum's global success over the last few years. Doing that got quite a lot of saliva on my face. One thing you don't want to do, sneeze inside the zebra mask. You'll get Ebola. Uh, next up, the YKK group. This one I've heard of. Spoiler alert, they make zippers, because we made a, a video on Today I Found Out about this. Here's a company, Today I Found Out, another YouTube channel I do. It's got like millions of subscribers, so the chances of you just stumbling across business plays and being like, what's Today I Found Out? Pretty low. Someone the other day commented, is this the same dude from Today I Found Out? And I just wrote, no, what's that? Here's a company that was established way back in 1934. You probably own several of their products in your home. You might even be wearing one right now. I'm sorry, Danny, I've ruined this, haven't I? <laughs> Unlike some of the other companies in this video, they're actually quite keen for you to know who they are, and they've recently been making attempts to raise their profile, but sadly, you just don't care. The YKK Group is a Japanese manufacturing company whose main focus for over 80 years has been the production of zips or zippers. I assume those things usually come together as one item, Danny, like the zip and the zipper. It'd be like, yeah, no, I just need some zips. Do you need any uh, zippers to go with that? No, just the zips. <laughs> now generating $10 billion a year in revenue. Wow. YKK currently owns 46% of the global zipper market, producing 1.2 million miles of zippers every year. If you're wearing a zipper right now, there's a good chance it's a YKK zip. You might want to briefly pause to take a look if you can spot the YKK logo edged onto the zip. Danny says, probably best not to do this on camera, Simon. Tell you what, Danny, I'll make the decisions about what's okay on camera. No, I'm not gonna do that, but I am. <laughs> Hold on. Okay, I really expected it to say YKK, but it says Levis. I guess because I'm wearing Levis trousers and they took it in house, or maybe on the back? I did, the when we made the video on today, I found out Danny was absolutely right. My zipper was YKK, but now it's just Levis. I guess Levis make their own zippers now. They make zippers for Levis jeans, fire suits, fish farm nets, bagpipes. <laughs> bagpipes have zippers? And even spacesuits. When Neil Armstrong took his first step onto the moon in 1969, a YKK zipper was holding his spacesuit together. They recently produced a series of short anime videos called Fastening Days. <laughs> This already sounds bad, doesn't it? <laughs> Where three futuristic heroes use YKK zippers to rescue an endangered city and once again feel a connection with the surrounding world. Normally I look up videos when we get the opportunity. Hard pass. The videos have allegedly racked up more than 13 million views, but I challenge you to find anyone who actually watches them. I'm gonna bet they paid for those views. <laughs> Luxotica. This is another one I know because of a video we made on today I found out. This should be like, yeah, this is um, five huge successful companies that you've probably never heard of, but Simon or fans of today I found out absolutely have. The Italian company Luxotica is another company that have designed products you're very likely to have worn. The company is by far the largest in its field, now commanding more than a quarter of all sales in its industry and market capitalization of around 57 billion euros. But what do they make? They make eyewear. Spoiler alert, it's eyewear. <laughs> Prescription sunglasses, designer frames, cool shades, pretty much anything that sits on the top of your nose. I'm trying to think of something funny that also sits on top of my nose. I got nothing. <laughs> Their most famous brands include Ray-Bans, Lenscrafters, Sunglasses Hut, Purcell, and Oakley. Luxottica also produce frames for design labels like Prada, Chanel, Armani, and Versace, and they're currently working with Google on the next generation of Google Glass. That's gonna be great. I don't know, just based on the massive success of Google Glass 1. <laughs> A friend of mine got some Google Glass, because he works for Google, and he was like, these are pretty great and then he never ever wore them again. Uh, in fact, the company dominates the eyewear industry to such a degree that the only time you're likely to hear their name in the press is when they're being criticized for monopolistic pricing practices. Luxottica don't just make glasses, they pretty much control the labs, the manufacturers, the frame makers, and the insurers, using their dominance and clout to, clout to put the squeeze on the eyewear brands and burying them if they don't play eyeball. But a bum bum their monopoly of the market is also pushing up prices of frames to ridiculous levels. A typical pair of designer frames that cost around $800 to buy are only likely to cost a total of $15 to produce. One, that's absurd. But what's more absurd is who the hell spends $800 on eyeglasses? I, uh, all of my glasses were free because I got a Glasses USA sponsor, but they're like 100 bucks for prescription glasses. Danny finishes up. Luxottica, the company you previously may not have known about, but now should learn to hate. <laughs> Otis Elevator Company. I can't help feeling that Otis should be one of the most famous companies in the world. Uh, I don't feel like, I feel like I don't know this, or I feel like, you know, 
Maybe I've been in elevators and you've seen, you know, the panel or whatever. Does it say Otis? <laughs> There's an elevator in my building. I would go check, but I don't want to go outside in Norway. I can't help a feeling that Otis should be one of the most famous companies in the world. Let's just take a quick look at some of the things they've got going for them. Number one, they design elevators, which has got to be one of the coolest jobs ever invented in the history of planet Earth if maybe just very slightly dangerous. All right, Danny, whatever you're into. <laughs> like when I think of cool jobs, what do you want to be? Astronaut, movie star, elevator designer. All right, Danny, chill out. Number two, they're an American company with a very long history. In fact, they've been around for over 160 years. I love how an American, it's like, it's got a really long history, 160 years. The whole of Europe's like, please. <laughs> I think my apartment's like 160 years old. The founder of the company, Elisha Otis, actually invented the elevator brake back in 1852, which experts later considered to be a pretty important component of an elevator. Yeah. As a child, I was scared of elevators, because I was like, I saw a movie, I felt like it was a James Bond movie, where he falls down an elevator shaft, and I was way too young to see it, and it scared me from elevators. Like, the bottom open up, opens up or something. And then it's, yeah, it's pretty scary. If anyone knows that movie, let me know. Number three, to test out his new invention, Elisha Otis performed a death defying stunt at the New York World Fair in 1854, in which he had himself hoisted up to the up to dizzying heights in his new elevator platform and then cut all of the supporting cables in the face of a horrified crowd. Thankfully, the elevator brake worked, and the company sold its very first elevator three years later. Number four. 160 years on, Otis Elevators are generating over $12 billion per year. Their elevators have been installed in countless famous buildings around the world, including the Eiffel Tower, the Empire State Building, and the original World Trade Center. There you go. And we still haven't heard of them. But what, what does a pioneering elevator company have to do to get noticed? And I feel like elevator companies do install their name in every elevator, but the fact that I don't remember it, and you probably don't either, does say a lot. Next time you're in an elevator, I'm gonna get, we call them lifts in the UK. But I appreciate the fact that Danny's Americanized this, because we definitely understand elevator. But it'd be weird if, you know, it probably sounds a bit weird to Brits watching that saying elevator, because we say it's a lift. Tencent. Finally, it's possible that you may just have heard of the Chinese company Tencent. I have, not because I've made a video about it, but it's everywhere in China. <laughs> and I've been to China. You'll have heard of it if, it's, if you're particularly techie or a hardcore gamer, or you live in China, or you're the founder of the company. <laughs> I'm not gonna do my third bada boom boom ch this episode. Uh, also, someone pointed out that it's not bada boom boom ch, it's but I prefer my version. It's like extended rim shots. But considering that Tencent is one of the largest web companies in the world, it's surprising that they're not yet a global household name, and they're not yet mentioned in the same breath as Amazon, Google, or Facebook, despite giving all of those companies a serious run for their money. Founded back in 1998, Tencent first got off the grounds by launching their simple instant messenger service, Tencent QQ, which now boasts 647 million registered users and is technically the largest community of all time. Is that more than Facebook? But they've come a long way since the early days with a market value of $500 billion. Holy sh**. Tencent is now the world's biggest gaming company, one of the world's biggest social media companies, and one of the world's biggest venture capital firms. They've dabbled in web portals, e-commerce, smartphones, internet services, and payment systems. And if that wasn't enough, Tencent also owns most of China's music services. I guess, like, monopolistic practices, not really a thing in China yet. <laughs> Despite their status as one of Asia's most valuable companies in all of history, Tencent is still relatively unknown outside of China, as the company name tends to, tends to stay largely hidden behind better-known brand names and franchises. Kind of like Yum! I can't believe Yum! Which is the one of these that, other than maybe Otis, is like the one I use most often, KFC, and I'd heard of the others, which I'd never use. Or YKK. Although now these are Levis. <laughs> but as the company continues to expand and invest in new technologies, it's not totally inconceivable that Tencent could one day become even, fa even more famous and successful than Google. However, they might not win any awards for innovation. Because it's just to be said that most of Tencent's flourishing services are very similar to other existing services like WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, Skype, Instagram, and many others. The founder and CEO of Tencent, Huateng Pony, <laughs> Ma has often been dubbed the king of copying, and there are worries about the company's negative impact on other budding Chinese business startups. Whereas Americans may dream of becoming rich by coming up with a brilliant new idea that gets bought by Google, the Chinese are more likely to have dreams about becoming seriously pissed off by coming up with a brilliant idea that then just gets copied and turned into a success with the resources and wealth of Tencent. Yeah, that is a bit unfair, isn't it? <laughs> In his defense, Pony simply says that to copy is not evil. <laughs> Wait, that makes no sense whatsoever. Whatsoever. It's like, yeah, you're in trouble for copying. Copying's not evil. Hitler. Yeah, you're in trouble for genocide. 
Genocide's not evil. Yes, it is! <laughs> and he probably knows what he's talking about. Copying everybody else has made him the richest man in China and the 20th richest man in the world. This has been Business Blaze. Thank you for watching all the way to the end. If you are here, here's a little reward for you. I absolutely know that these trousers are called Levi's, but have a look below for all of the people who didn't finish the video and have you go at me for pronouncing it Levis. Have a great day, everybody. Like and subscribe. Smash the.